somebody letting them in? Yeah, I got it, Debbie. Thank you. Hi, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Garden Hour with MU Extension. As always, we're delighted to be here with you to answer your gardening questions and those things that are curiosities in the yard, in the garden, on your trees, on your house plants, whatever it might be, and you can't figure it out, give us a holler, and we're happy to answer those for you, as always. We have a nice lineup today, got lots and lots of information. Um, so my name is Debbie Kelly. I'm the horticulture specialist in Jefferson County. We have Justin, Jennifer, Minoj, uh, Tony is here with the weather, and then Pong is here with I See a Sick Plant. Um, so we're always happy to see um, all of us here answering your questions. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and I'm going to turn it quickly over to Tony with the weather report. And hopefully he has some great information for us this week. Tony, if you're talking, are are you're muted? I'm not sure why I'm having so much trouble this morning. So let me get my slideshow started, and then I'll share. So, um, there we go. Share screen. All right, let's get on with the weather uh, quickly. And this week, I have a little bit of uh, cautious optimism. Uh, more than I've had in at least six weeks, let's put it that way. Um, yesterday, we saw temperatures across the state, mostly in the upper 70s to near 80 if you lived in an urban area. Uh, you can see it is pretty cool for our neighbors to the northeast. Today, we're seeing a little bit of what I call the inevitable. In uh, the summer in Missouri, it's inevitably going to be warmer and humid and uh, I think we're seeing the warm part coming in today. Things will be in the mid 80s for the most part, and it's going to stay that way for a while. Uh, the uh, surface map is showing high pressure over us, uh, and this was from yesterday, actually. But we're seeing a little bit more activity flaring up along the southern storm track, which I'm going to show later on. But uh, we're seeing. Uh, moisture pop up in the Rockies as well. And I think some of this is going to end up in our backyard soon enough. Right now, or uh, yesterday anyway, the dew points were still fairly low in the 40s and 50s, which is uh, helping to evaporate out all that nice water we got over the weekend. A lot of you saw some uh, rain over this weekend. Some areas got over an inch. Others didn't get so much, but it looked like it was fairly widespread, at least on Sunday. Uh, the flow is beginning to look like it should in the summertime with a jet stream across southern Canada, but also one has been developing across the southern tier of the United States, and that's actually some good news that the El Nino may be trying to kick in and do what it does, and that's bring us a little more moisture in the summer. But again, the last 30 days have been sounding about the same every time. There are some areas of the state are getting rain, some local areas doing actually pretty good. Uh, others not so good, or most of us not so good. So. Unless you live in these two little areas here in central Missouri and then near Cape Girardeau, uh, you're not doing quite as well as most others. So uh, that's where we are now. And uh, last week's drought map that came out, uh, the Missouri map doesn't look any worse than it did at the end of May. And I think tomorrow's map is probably going to look about the same, where we did see some worsening as areas to our east. 
and in along the Ohio Valley. So it was a little worse overall, but at least for us, it wasn't too bad. So uh, look for that not to change too much. I've been traveling the four corners of the state in the last few weeks, showing you some statistics from there. And of course, we saw that spring temperatures were within what we would call normal, but we were just getting ever more drier during the summer or during the uh, springtime. And June so far has started out kind of like spring was, you know, temperatures are slightly above normal in most places, not much to write home about. But uh, on the precipitation front, uh, we're a little bit below normal for June, which means we haven't lost too much more ground, uh, except for folks in Springfield. But uh, most of us have not lost too much more ground since the end of May. What's changing? All right, I've been showing these maps for the last two weeks, and I decided to show just what was happening last week. Last week looked similar to the end of May, but this blocking pattern, this ridge pattern, which has been keeping us dry, seems to be breaking down a little bit, and that's some good news. So uh, let me show you the uh, differences from normal for these things. Again, we saw very strong high pressure in Canada at the uh, middle of May. At the end of May, extremely strong high pressure, and we saw low pressure beginning to develop along the southern tier of states. And this is what was bringing that wrong way weather we had for a little while, uh, where storms were traveling east to west, but we're seeing things starting to go the right way again. But we can see that in the last week, this high pressure in Canada has gotten weaker and the jet stream along the southern tier of states is increasing. And that's gonna mean more moisture from off the Pacific. And I think that's good news. I think that's a sign that El Nino is finally beginning to do what it does. Now, what does that mean for us for the summer? Because remember, a lot of areas are still in deficit for precipitation, and a lot of us still have dry reservoirs and streams and lakes, so there's not a lot to work with there. Well, the next week, the pros at NSEP forecast that uh, looks like we're going to get, again, some ramp up in the moisture along the southern tier of states. And anywhere from, it looks like one to two inches of precipitation across Missouri. And that's some positive news. And like last week, I think the best chance for this is going to be Saturday afternoon into Sunday morning, which is what it was last week. And that was pretty much what happened. Uh, and so I think the, the models were pretty good last week. Uh, nothing new at the summer outlook. We'll update that next week, possibly if they have a new one out. The six to 10 day outlooks, again, are looking a little better. Uh, a little warm for us in the next six to 10 days. But as I said, the inevitable is happening. That, that warmer, humid weather for, that Missouri's used to for the summer is finally beginning to make its appearance. And as you can see, there's two main areas of above normal precipitation for the next six days. And they predict that at least we'll be in that near normal regime, which is better news than I've been bringing the last few weeks. Even better toward the end of June and early July. Again, we're seeing the ramp up possibly of this southern storm track. And if this forecast comes into being, uh, we'll be seeing some above normal precipitation back here in Missouri. And uh, I think that, uh, again, if we can get enough precipitation to where we can limp along here in the summer, uh, we, may, we may end up 
doing not so badly, even though everything underneath is still very dry. So maybe we'll get enough to limp on through the summer here. And this is the best I have felt in about six weeks. Uh, again, if you're not a part of Coco Raz, please join us. We do want your measurements. Follow us on uh, Facebook and Twitter. Again, we'd like to get our follower numbers up. And if you got some friends that wouldn't mind following us, that would be great too. So the forecast for this week, again, today and tomorrow are going to be mostly sunny for most areas, um, mid to upper 80s in most places, but near 90 tomorrow, especially if you live in an urban area like St. Louis, Kansas City, Columbia, or Springfield. Uh, Thursday night and Wednesday night, both nights should be uh, mainly clear, but uh, some areas in the southwest and west may see showers and thunderstorms. Again, tonight will be in the upper 50s to near 60 statewide, and then tomorrow night, more or less the low to mid 60s. Friday looks like a chance of some weather or of some rain. We could get uh, hit and miss across the state, high in the mid to upper 80s to near 90. And uh, Friday night, showers, thunderstorms will taper off as the heat of the day comes down, uh, low in the low to mid 60s. And Saturday and Sunday, both days, all right, we'll see mixed clouds and a chance of showers and thunderstorms, a more widespread event is what I'm thinking. And even Saturday night, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, and into Sunday morning, we could see some of these storms become on the severe side or the strong side. And I think most of us would trade off a little wind for some good soaking rains, but uh, high both days around 80 in the north to mid to upper 80s elsewhere. And then both nights and around 60 in the north to low to mid 60s elsewhere. And then early next week, Again, our summer pattern looks to start to kick in both days, upper 80s to near 90, which is very typical for uh, Missouri this time of year, a chance of some hit and miss showers and thunderstorms both of those days, uh, and then lows in the mid to upper 60s. So uh, it looks like starting next week, we're going to be in that warm summer and hopefully more humid conditions as well, which will uh, slow down the evaporation. All right, uh, and one more map to show just the soil moisture. Uh, we're seeing that the soil moisture is actually not too bad in the southern part of the state, but in the northwest part of the state, you're bone dry all the way down to four inches and even below that. So. Um, uh, hopefully we'll be seeing some of this relief coming along. And again, I'm as optimistic as I've been in about six weeks. So any questions? I don't see any in the chat box. So I think that we are fine. Nice to see a little bit more moisture coming our way. Wish it wasn't on a weekend, but you know, hey, that's when it happens. So we'll take it. Uh, All right. Again, we'll Tony, when we can get it. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Tony. We greatly appreciate it. Like I said earlier, we've got lots of information today. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Justin. Uh, Justin is going to be our moderator for today and kick us off. Justin, go, go for it. All right. Thanks, Debbie. Um, so we had a question submitted um, through our website. Uh, someone bought a property with free, three fruit trees, apple, pear, and peach. Uh, pe peach and apple trees look healthy, but the pear tree has what they believe is fire blight. Uh, we got some pictures, for, fortunately. Um, so the homeowner is wondering uh, what they can do to support the health of that tree. And Jennifer Shooter is going to answer that topic. All right, thank you, Justin. So yes, I'm gonna talk about fire blight and fire blight can be a serious problem on apple and pear trees. 
And a question we often get is, how is it spread and how do I control that? So fire blight is a bacterial disease. So it's not caused by a fungus. It is a bacterial disease and it affects apples, crab apples, pear trees, hawthorns, and pyrocantha or fire thorn and other related species. The bacteria overwinters in cankers, which are those dark sunken areas in the uh, bark of your tree. The bacteria is spread from the cankers by insects and by windblown rain. And that's why this problem is more serious, or it is serious, in the springtime. Usually in May and early June is when we see this appear on our apple and pear trees particularly. Uh, careless pruning practices may also spread the bacteria. So you want to clean your tools as you uh, work from tree to tree. So I already mentioned it is more severe in the springtime and when soil moisture is high. It's also more common when bud and shoot development is rapid, which is the springtime, and temperatures are 60 to 75 degrees. So that's the temperature range that it likes or it will um, thrive in. Uh, rain and high humidity are prolonged. Um, that, that's a time when we, we also see it. It is not known to cause fruit drop. So some people may be having fruit drop right now. They may wonder, well, is fire blight causing my fruit to drop off? Usually it is insects that do that. Insects like the cucurlio uh, are what cause uh, fruit to drop off the tree. I mean, there can be a few other causes, but it's mainly insects. So it's not really likely that fire blight is causing the fruit to drop off your tree. Here are some photos showing you fire blight. The first one, uh, or the photo on the left is a Bradford pear tree. And we are not um, promoting that tree and telling you to plant that anymore. But we do know that those trees can also get fire blight. On the right side, you see photos of the branches up close. And notice that there is a, like a shepherd's crook in the photo at the top there. So fire blight is affecting the tip inward about 18 inches and see how it appears as if it's been scorched by fire. Fire blight has been observed to be most severe on vigorously growing trees. And around here, typically the fruit trees of the apples and pear trees. And for this reason, you wanna pay careful attention to the amount of fertilizer that you apply uh, you don't want to be overdoing it on the nitrogen fertilizer to where you're stimulating a lot of new growth on the trees. One of the best ways to avoid fire blight is to avoid planting uh, uh, cultivars that are susceptible. And there are some European and Asian pear varieties that are showing good resistance. We have a list of those varieties. So if anybody is interested in knowing which varieties have the resistance, uh, just reach out and we will get that list to you. And there is a, a chemical or product you can use called streptomycin. It is a bactericide. It is not a fungicide. So it's a bactericide or antibiotic that is used to control fire blight. And you want to apply streptomycin when temperatures are above 65 degrees and when flowers are open. Most of the time we tell you do not apply anything when the flowers are open, especially insecticides, because you will kill your pollinators. But this is a product that you want to apply when the blooms are open, because that is the time when this disease uh, enters the, the flowers and you'll start seeing the symptoms. So that is the time to apply it. And a minimum of two applications is necessary to provide control. And then always read the label directions. So no matter what product you're applying, it's very important to read and follow the label directions. This is just showing you the streptomycin products. They are available at most garden centers and nurseries or can be ordered from a garden supply company. And then you can also prune out the disease branches when it is hot and dry. Usually by July, it is hot, it's dry, and you can go out with a pair of pruners and clip out the affected foliage. You wanna cut at least eight inches below the infected branch.
Hey, Jennifer, we, we lost your audio. So uh, that, that's really important. So make sure that you dry, dry and oil your tools. But do do um, clean them before you go from, this says from, you know, clean them after every cut, but at least do it after moving to the next tree. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Justin. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so we had a question come in that I am going to cover related to um, the best ground covers for shady sites. Uh, I think the question particular was for deep shade. So let me get this pulled up here. Okay. So um, these pictures are not from the person that submitted the questions. This actually came into one of our offices in Northeast Missouri. Somebody had bought a vacation property uh, on a lake and there were some issues with erosion after they did some pruning uh, or removing of brush. So um, this is definitely a challenging shady site. And so we're gonna talk about some options uh, related to what you can do in your landscape for those kind of sites. So if we think about ground covers, um, probably one of the more common um, and effective ground covers in terms of spreading uh, in shady areas is periwinkle or vinca minor. Um, so it does put on some pretty flowers in the spring and then kind of intermittently throughout the summer. Um, it doesn't really like to be in very wet sites. Um, so anywhere you need to plant, it would need to have some kind of slope or sufficient drainage. Um, you can purchase uh, rooted cuttings um, or small plug plants. Uh, recommendations are 12 to 18 inches apart. Uh, that'll take a couple years to have a full coverage. Um, at a six inch spacing, you can get full cover in about a year. But with any ground cover, um, you're not gonna be able to buy enough plants to completely fill it out uh, right from the start. So there's gonna be some weed management uh, in that between time when you plant and when those plants spread. Uh, Missouri, we don't really have um, an invasive plant list or prohibited plants from planting, but sometimes I look at other states for this information. Um, Illinois, or pardon me, Indiana had like a invasive plant advisory board and looking at some of their publications, they do suggest to keep these plantings confined to urban areas, um, planting only next to concrete or lawns um, and maybe avoid planting these in more rural areas as they might escape um, into some of the some of the more natural areas. So there are some hosta varieties um, that are that are very tolerant of shade. It kind of varies a little bit with the varieties. Uh, Missouri Botanical Garden has some great resources and list a couple of these varieties that do well in more of a full shade environment. Um, with hostas, there can be some division. So, you know, you can multiply your planting for free um, if you're dividing plants appropriately and, and replanting them to help get some natural spread and not to have to invest so much money up front to try to get, you know, hundreds of plants out there. There's also some ferns that do well in full or deep shade. Um, the Christmas fern is on the top left and then the ostrich fern is on the bottom right. These are both native to North America. Um, these can also be divided in planting. These both spread through rhizomes. Um, so that rhizome can be severed um, and replanted at that original soil level um, to get some spread of these without necessarily have to purchasing more plants. But all that spread of all those plants is going to take time and you could invest a lot of money pretty quickly. Um, also, a lot of times these shady sites, they're under big trees, right? So those trees can have very extensive root systems, which, which can provide competition for nutrients and for water. It can also just be really hard to plant because there's just so many roots there um, and you risk, you know, injuring tree roots when you're trying to get into some of these really shady sites. So I just kind of costed some things out here with Vinca Minor. Let's say we had a 500 square foot planting. 
Um, I just pulled some online prices for buying flats of these uh, 50 in a flat. So at a 12 inch spacing, which is going to take a couple years to fill in, that's about 500 bucks. A uh, thousand plants at a six inch spacing, that's about a thousand bucks. And that does not include shipping, which is going to be pretty expensive. Uh, well, what if we just thought about laying some mulch down and then kind of filling it in with some specimen plants or some sparser plantings of ground cover? So I found a really good online mulch calculator, and there's a number of these available from uh, both public uh, universities and from businesses. So let's just say we wanted to drop uh, two inches deep of mulch on a 500 square foot area. I pulled up some pricing from a local mulch supplier for just basic undyed shredded mulch at 27 bucks a cubic yard. And using this calculator, I came up with the fact that we need about three yards, which would run about $81 and then any delivery fees. So you can see cost-wise, it can be a lot cheaper and a lot less uh, maintenance until these ground cover plants really fill out. So the nice thing about, about mulching is it really helps those plants pop. It just has a really, uh, really pretty contrast there. The tree roots will also benefit as those uh, mulch materials decay and build organic matter in the soil and provide habitat for all kinds of uh, soil macro and microorganisms. Um, you can have really good aesthetic appeal by adding things like edging and borders or stepping stones. So a lot of times these are around trees. So I'm gonna show you a picture of how to mulch around a tree. And this is not it. This is a mulch volcano. We're not gonna go too deep into mulching specifics, but avoid this scenario um but yeah you can you can put mulch beds and group them around trees and give some flow to it whether it's a circle or a more uh, organic shape um you can add a really nice appeal and you can pop in some plants not necessarily have to buy as many for a ground cover um so this is just an idea to give you okay in a shady site Maybe I don't have to think about planting a full ground cover, but maybe there's some things I can do uh, with mulch in that site and fewer plants and still have a really beautiful landscape. Uh, there's some resources dropped in the chat box there if you guys want to take a look at any of this further. And that is all I have for that. And so um, we did have also some questions coming in about fruit drop on fruit trees um, that's also known as June drop. And so Debbie is gonna go ahead and handle that topic. I had to figure out how to mute me, unmute me here, guys. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so fruit drop. Um, fruit drop is not uncommon in trees and a lot of times we'll see a lot of fruit drop when it happens in sometime in June and people get really nervous about that because they don't understand why. So fruit drop or June drop is its common name. It is a physiological issue. Essentially, it's a shortfall of food. So of carbohydrates that are in that actual tree. And what it is, is that each of one of those individual fruits needs a certain amount of leaf space or a certain amount of area of a tree to produce enough um, carbohydrates through photosynthesis and, for, and through fertilization to be able to feed that fruit to get to the size of where it actually needs to go. And so what's happening then is that um, it once the fruit is not actually, um, there's not enough leaves that are growing there, then what happens is, is that, uh, I'm sorry, I, I apologize right now. Am I still on? Yeah, we still got you, Debbie. Okay, someone is, was trying to call me on Teams, and so that got me very, very um, confused right there. So I apologize, guys. Let me start. Okay, so I'm going to go back to there's limited photosynthesis that's actually occurring in the trees. And so fruits need uh, an abundant amount of those carbohydrates, enough from photosynthesis in order for that fruit to grow to the size of what it needs to do. If there's not enough leaf growth, especially when the trees are much smaller and it's setting a lot of flowers with fruit, um, it's going to naturally 
have the, the lesser of those fruits are going to be able to fall and drop to the ground. It's kind of like a survival of the fittest of the trees, if we think about it in that fashion. Now, what you can do is go ahead and prune off some of those smallers. A lot of times the, our fruits will come in bunches. And as you're looking at that bunch of like two, three, or four of those apples or peaches together, look at those that are the smallest or those that um, look healthiest without any kind of insect or disease damage. Leave those, take the smaller ones or take those that might look like they might have some damage to it and go ahead and prune those off yourself. Otherwise, if you don't, there will be a natural fruit drop that occurs. When we're looking at apples in particular, there are two times when actually there will be fruit drop on these trees. Shortly after petal fall for about two to three weeks, simply due to lack of pollination. So we have lots of these gorgeous blooms on some of our fruit trees. And if there's not enough bees around to pollinate those trees, um, then those flowers will start to actually look like it's going to develop, but then they will actually fall off. And then, of course, June drop, and that's just simply because there are a lot of pollinators and a lot of flowers, and we've got lots of fruits that were starting to grow. There are some other possibilities as to why there might be fruit drops. So we want to look at that. June drop is natural. It just naturally occurs. But we also want to look at that fruit once it actually falls to the ground. So there are some different things that could happen. So for example, it could be a codling moth. So the codling moth is this picture up here. This is the larva that's going to be on the inside of that fruit. And there will probably be some sort of an injury to the out outer edge of this fruit where the moth actually laid its eggs inside of that particular fruit. We can also have plum curcurio. And so you'll notice the damage that's going to be right here. And so again, naturally, this will fall off of it, off of the tree. If there's not, if there is a heavy fruit set, if there is not heavy fruit set, it may stay on the tree. So again, just as we think about walking through our crops when we're in the vegetable garden or the flower garden looking for insects and diseases, we also want to do that with our fruit trees as well. So if you see damage like this or anything like this, then you might want to go ahead and take that particular piece of fruit off so that it doesn't have the potential of, of hatching and then going ahead and potentially setting fruit or setting eggs and doing additional damage. A third one is going to be the oriental moth. And again, you're going to see damage on the outer edges of the fruit itself. And so as you go to prune, go ahead and take those off. If you notice, most of these insects are going to have complete metamorphosis, which means that they're going to go ahead and lay an egg. They'll come out as a larva or a caterpillar. Then they will actually come out as an adult, whether it's going to be some sort of an insect itself, a beetle type insect, whether it's a moth or it's going to be, uh, chances are it's going to be more of a moth than, than a butterfly. Another fourth reason, and again, this would be physiological, is that if we're in a drought and the trees are not getting enough water, to be able to supply that fruit with the water that it needs to go through its complete maturity. So again, fruit drop in June is normal. If you see the fruit that's on the ground, go ahead and pick some up. Look for potential damage on that to make sure that it's its natural physiological uh, way of being able to survival of the fittest of the tree. Uh, cut those fruits open to see if there's any damage on the inside. And then you'll know for sure exactly what might be occurring with drought. We know, pay attention to the weather. And again, I apologize for that. Someone trying to call me on the computer. All right. Thanks, Debbie. Um, so <clears throat> we had a question come in with some great photos that I want to share. Um, and it was related to some foliar issues that were coming up on some grapes. So I am going to dive into that topic. All right. So fortunately, we got some really good picks, which we always appreciate. We got some uh, top surface of the leaf, some bottom surface of the leaf. And I don't know a ton about grapes, but when I first saw this, it kind of reminded me of some symptoms of downy mildew where you might have some 
uh, sporulation or growth of that organism on the bottom of the leaf. Um, so the information we got from the homeowner, and we always appreciate as much information as we can get, um, established about 25 vines. Uh, they gave us the variety. So this is the Norton variety. Um, let us know that this white residue was from a prior application of Mancozeb. Let us know what they fertilized, um, some other things added to the foliage. So we really, really appreciate all that information. So uh, fortunately for me, I have some great colleagues that have a lot of experience with grapes and I kind of bounce this around. Um, and we do have a grape and wine institute in the state of Missouri. We have a very strong uh, grape industry, as a lot of you uh, may know. So what it turns out this was, was actually what we call phytotoxicity. So I'm going to kind of go back, come back to the grapes in particular, but I just wanted to mention phytotoxicity more broadly. So this is um, really any kind of plant injury that occurs due to chemical application. So this could be an application of an insecticide, a plant growth regulator, it could be a foliar application of fertilizer. And there's a couple ways that this can happen. So you could have followed the label recommendations um, to the T, but maybe it was really hot and sunny when you applied it. Or maybe that plant was already very drought stressed. Um, so the picture on the top, this was actually, uh, I believe this was a horticultural oil or insecticidal soap plus pyrethrins. Um, this one in the middle here, this was someone had made an insecticidal soap from dish soap. And this one in the bottom is actually from contaminated compost. Um, so you could have followed all the rules, um, but still had some response from the plant. Um, you could have not followed the guidelines. Maybe you, you applied it to a plant that was not on that label, or maybe you applied it at a higher rate of concentration than was recommended. You can also have uh, movement of agricultural chemicals. We most commonly see this in terms of herbicide drift, um, but they were applied to a target crop and then somehow moved to a sensitive crop. You can also have problems with um, improperly clean sprayers, especially if you've maybe used a herbicide in a sprayer and then switched to an insecticide without properly cleaning that out. Uh, this picture on the bottom, contaminated compost in tomatoes produces this very distorted growth and that's a persistent herbicide that basically goes from the hay uh, through the horse or cow into the poo, into the compost, into the soil, and then into the plant. It's very persistent class of herbicides. Or you may have followed the label to the T, but maybe there's a, spe a specific variety of a crop or a plant that has phytotoxic symptoms. So I emailed this to the director of our Grape and Wine Institute, and he let me know, he actually wrote an article on this, there is phytotoxicity specifically related to the Norton grapes um, and this fungicide Mancozeb. And basically, uh, when Mancozeb, if stored improperly and there's a lot of oxygen getting into the container, uh, it degrades into different uh, bioactive compounds that could then cause uh, damage to, to the Norton variety in particular. Um, an alternative fungi fungicide would be Captan, uh, but with any fungicide or insecticide, you need to check the pre-harvest interval because it might say, you know, you have to apply, you have to have 40 days between application and harvest. So that's another important thing uh, to investigate uh, besides the phytotoxicity. So how can you avoid this? Um, make sure you read that label completely, follow all those guidelines, concentration. Uh, do they recommend an adjuvant which helps it stick to the leaf? If so, what kind? Are there temperature restrictions, time of day? How, you know, is it sunny? Should it be applied in the morning? Are there specific varieties that are listed that, that might be susceptible to damage? Maybe some things you can spray when the plant is older, but not as young or vice versa. Some herbicides that might be applied to the soil, they might have plant back restrictions. So it might say you can apply this, but you have to wait nine months to plant this crop. Um, PPE, make sure even a lot of the pesticides that are available to homeowners, make sure you read that label. It may tell you to wear gloves, goggles, long sleeve shirt, etc. If you're using a sprayer for multiple different kinds of agricultural chemicals, 
make sure that it's cleaned and rinsed. The label usually have information on that. And they also make a spray tank cleaner that's good at binding up those chemicals and getting them out of the sprayer. Um, on a little bit more on the technical side, if you're managing a little bit more crops, uh, calibrating sprayers and making sure you're following the coverage recommendations. Calibration is a uh, would be a whole nother talk, but probably the easiest thing to do is just spray a little, spray some of it on maybe just one plant or a portion of a plant and wait for a time to see if there are any reactions to that material. That's probably the easiest way. And if you're trying a new material in your garden, a, make sure you read the label and B, just try it on a small portion of the planting to make sure that you don't have any phytotoxic reactions. We have some great resources for grapes, both for um, home grape production. We have a pretty good guide that lists a lot of different varieties and some of their attributes. Um, we have a really great Grape and Wine Institute in Missouri. They have a newsletter you can subscribe to um, and also uh, we have a really good Midwest fruit pest management guide that covers all of the common fruit crops. So that is all I have on that. And I am going to go ahead and hand it over to Manoj, who is going to talk to us a little bit about irrigation technologies for the landscape. Sure. Thank you, Justin. Okay, so let me pull the screen. There you go. Yeah, so hello everybody. Um, today I'm going to talk about landscape irrigation and some technology that are available in the market for landscape irrigation. Uh, so when it comes to landscape outdoor irrigation, we recommend typically applying one inch of irrigation water every week and depending on different grass type, plant type, soil type, it varies, right? So when if you have an in-ground sprinkler system in your home, then many of you might have a controller uh, maybe from Hunter or something like that, which we call a traditional controller, which works based on the calendar or, or dates. Uh, basically, you set up irrigations like Tuesday or Thursday, once or twice a week, run 30 minutes per zone, something like that. Right? So these traditional controllers do not take into account of any external factors like your um, weather conditions, plant type, soil type, and things like that. So it's kind of a little bit outdated and dumb technology. Um, and so there is a new technology in the market, which we call smart irrigation controllers. And these controllers, what they do is they take into account of different weather conditions, plant types, soil types. Uh, and there are a lot of, uh, lot of features that, uh, that these technologies or controllers can do depending on products. So I'll just spend some little bit time on what is uh, these new technologies and, and some devices and sensors, okay? So first thing to start is the rain sensor. So in the top one is the one example of rain sensors. It basically is, it tells you how much rain you got on your site. And then depending on that amount of rainfall, uh, the sensor sends the signals to your controller and basically bypass the irrigation. So if you have, for example, rain yesterday, then it will tell your controller that, hey, we had a rain yesterday, so the irrigation is scheduled today would be bypassed. That's how this saves water. Again, this is more effective in the areas where we have a lot of rain, right? If you if you are in a very dry area, this might not be a great use because um, it's just sensing rainfall. Another sensor we have is a soil moisture sensor. So there are different kinds in the market. One are uh, one of those are with the wire. You have to wire them to the controller and other are wireless, like the here, for example, from Toro. So these both wired or wireless sensors, soil moisture sensors that, that can go to the ground. Um, you have to bury them at four inch soil depth. Uh, and then these sensors will send signals to your controller, right? So what it does, it, it tells you the exact amount of soil water right, at the root zone depth. And that's where you need to know, right? If, if you can, you can have rainfall, you can have irrigations above ground, but exactly how much water is in the soil is very precise and more accurate than any other data. So in terms of providing data to your controller, this is the most effective and very reliable information, but there is a challenge to put these things on the ground. And also depending on what kind of yard you have, uh, you might have to do number of those, you know, two or three uh, on your house just to get more representative samples 
uh, for your controllers. Another uh, one I want to talk about is the weather-based controller. So this is altogether a different controller. For example, let's say here's your uh, traditional controller or timer-based controller. Uh, if you can see in the picture here. So if you want to change this whole technology, then that smart controller, uh, we call that weather-based controller. This is a replacement to the whole system. And what it does is this controller altogether pulls the data from weather stations, okay? They can do either based on its own weather stations, which can be a little bit expensive to establish a uh, little micro weather stations, which can sense air temperature and relative humidity on your on-site. But also some of the controllers has the capability to pull the data from nearby weather stations from the cloud, if you will, and then it stores that data, reads that, and then understand how much water is needed on that week. And then sends that signals to your system to turn on irrigation for how long and how much, okay? So if you are wondering, okay, this is too much information and how do I start with it? So if you have a traditional controller, you can, upgrade that controller with a, with a receptor or with a modular like this one in this picture. And this modules, what it does, it, it makes your traditional controller a smart controller. What it does is now this modular or interface, if you will, will be able to sense those uh, data from your rain sensors or soil moisture sensors or air temperature sensors um, or even soil temperature sensors, whatever you have. So you can either upgrade your existing controller or you can change the whole system and buy this new a smart controller. So you have two options for the homeowners. Again, there's too much information in the market. There's every company that works with irrigations has produced some kind of, has manufactured some kind of uh, smart technologies. So there's a lot of information and one way to you know understand all these. And if you are really interested in understanding uh, what kind of products will be ideal for you, then there's a way, uh, there's information provided by irrigation associations and we'll drop the link on the chat box as well. It gives you a neat table of the manufacturer, the model and all the bells and whistles that particular model has in terms of you know, internet connectivity, uh, Wi-Fi. Um, do you need internet or not? Uh, can you control it from your smartphone applications? Things like that. Where does that particular model pull the data from? You know, what kind of data? Can we feed on that controller all kinds of stuff that we need uh, to understand in terms of selecting the product? It's a neat table. You can go and, and dig into this um, for understanding more about the products itself. But I want to also talk a little bit about this uh, irrigation system rebate. Uh, in the state of Missouri, uh, only city of Columbia offers this program. So this is basically a city uh, provide, providing some rebate to the homeowners who wants to upgrade their um, or, or have these um, smart irrigation technologies. So for the controller itself, uh, the rebate would be maximum of $150. For the rain sensors, $50 maximum. Uh, if you also want to upgrade your sprinkler heads, then you'll get $5 per head. So for all the products that you buy, you have to look for this uh, for this logo. It says water, uh, water sense logo approved by EPA. Only the items that has this logo uh, will be eligible for the rebate programs. So that will be all from my side. If you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Manoj. Um, next, I am going to go to uh, our plant diagnostic lab leader, uh, Dr. Pong Tien, and he is going to bring us some information about sick plants. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me pull up my uh, slides. Thank you, Justin. Um, reading mode. All right. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Peng Kong uh, from the Plant Diagnostic Clinic. Uh, welcome to the IC Sick Plants. So I received this uh, photo from our National Plant Diagnostic uh, Network. Uh, one colleague sent me this photo, um, wondering about those black seeds among those alfalfa seeds. You can see in this photo, there are a lot of uh, yellow seeds, but you, you, you can also see those black uh, seeds 
um, among those. So here basically is the client's comments. They wanted to identify what type of the wheat seeds. They thought that's kind of some kind of wheat seeds um, contaminated his alfalfa seeds. And uh, <clears throat> they're black in color instead of a normal yellow. And uh, when you look at those seeds, they're uh, cylind cylindrical and uh, they're almost like the same size and visually resembled the uncooked black rice. They sent a sample to a diagnostic lab in Nevada. The diagnostication process sample, they observed them under a microscope that nothing particularly unusual except the black layers. So they're thinking, were those seeds coated with a black dye or something? And then they put them in the water. They remain completely solid. They didn't germinate. So now my question is for all of you. So what could be the cause for those black seeds? I listed a poll. There are only four options. I give you about 20 seconds to give me the answer. So um, here's the poll. You can select whether it's an insect poop, cocoon, or fungus, or genetic mutation. Definitely, this is not a contaminated seeds or some wheat seeds. All right, that's great. Um, I give you 10 more seconds. Yeah, thank you for the response. I saw it's still changing, yeah. Okay, let, let me end the poll and share, share the poll. Insect frass is the winner, and then the genetic mutation, then fungus, then cocoon. All right, let me close this and review the answer. This is actually is a fungus issue. So my diagnostician uh, friends plated those seeds on the nutrient agar, which is shown here on the petri dish. In five days, they germinate and, and the produce those white fluffy. And on the top of the white fluffy, he was able to recover those black colored hard seeds all around the, the petri dish. So this is called white mold. Causal agent is the sclerotinia sclerotiorum. This is a soil one disease. They can produce a black sclerotia, which is a fungal structure shown in this photo. Those sclerotia has really hard shell, can stay in soil for almost more, more than five years. Therefore, it is a very devastating soil one disease for a really broad range of hosts. We just talked about alfalfa. Actually, this can affect most of the legume plants as well as vegetables. For example, uh, oh, by the way, this is the disease cycle I'm showing you. And this is the photo showing the soybean plant producing those black disclosure on the stem. Of course, there's a lot of white fluffy mycelium growing around it. That's where the name white mold come from. Uh, beginning with the with the disclosure, it will germinate in the spring and produce this structure called apothecia. The apothecia has a lot of gills. Each gill is like a mushroom, produce a lot of spores. The spore was infect the flowers and then causing the dieback and the leaf lesions. Over time, it will transfer, translocate into the stem and produce the black disclosure inside the seed pod as well as the stem. And then um, if the plants uh, died, the plant debris will be on the ground together with those closure and they can restart this whole life cycle. Like I said, it has really broad host range. I received this sample last year. On the peony, I found the white mold. You can tell those black structure inside the vascular system causing the dieback and lesions. And over time, putting the moist chamber, all the white fluffy thing growing out together with the disclosure. I plated the plant tissue on the uh, petri dish and you can tell uh, those uh, uh, sclosure um, uh, re uh, regerminate onto the, uh, on the plates. Again, disease control, proper rotation will be more effective since this is soil borne disease, they can stay in the soil for a while. Weak control is also significant because uh, you don't want the secondary host to carry this disease, contaminate your field. 
There are some very limited fungicide application can help, but it cannot completely get rid of them. You may want to shop around the resistant variety, uh, but so far it's uh, it's the number of the resistant variety for a different species, they vary. And I'm gonna show you one more photo of the C pod together with one exclusion in that. Did you get the right answer? Thank you so much for your response. Have a good day. All right, thanks so much, Pong. Yeah, we see that in tomatoes from time to time. Um, that they call it timber rot or white mold, and uh, I usually say they look kind of like rat turds. But um, I really appreciate that information. That's really really cool photos. So uh, we just got a couple minutes left here, um, Debbie. I'm wondering, do we have time for Hort terminology? Yeah, I'm happy to do that one. It is pretty quick. So let me get this one started up. The term for today is alkylation, if I'm saying that correctly. Let me get it in the right mode here. Okay, there you go. So does what is, what is this in respect to growing plants? Does it mean plants that need a certain amount of darkness to flower, covering or hiding plants from the sun, long day length for plants to bloom. So Jared, if you don't mind putting that up, thank you, Jared. Um, which of these is the correct definition? And just like Pong, I like seeing what all the answers are that are coming in. Um, we like to see how intelligent you guys are. And man, you guys are so smart. Oh, I might've, I might've got you guys on this one. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so let's go ahead and end the poll. Um, what it says here is 36% um, of you think it's A, and 32 and 32 for B and C. So I'm going to go ahead and stop share. Um, oh, Share results, stop share. Okay, there. So let's see what is the correct answer. And oculation is also known as tarping. It is a technique in the covering or hiding plants from the sun. And an example, of course, is the reason why we tarp is used predominantly to kill weeds. So I know a lot of folks will call and ask about cardboard or newspaper. Uh, those sorts of things. Sometimes uh, different colored tarps could be used. White tarp or clear tarp can be used. It will more or less do heating, but it will still have access to the sun. So chances are there could still be some photosynthesis. So using black tarp or dark colored tarping is probably best. But I heard this in a, in a presentation last week and I was like, oh, I got to use that term. See if you guys are smarter than I am, which some of you are because I had not heard this term before. So great, you guys are so smart. And with that, what I'm gonna go ahead and do, if it's okay with you, Justin, I'm going to go ahead and close this out uh, for, for today. So we're always happy to have you guys with us. Um, here is a map of all of us that are here. Again, we're happy to have Todd Higgins in a couple of weeks. He'll be on and, and answering your questions as well. He's going through all of his initial trainings and learning to know all about us and an extension with MU. So uh, we're happy to have him along. If you don't see this um, or if you don't get the name written down, just call your county extension office and they'll get you guys hooked up with whomever your horticulture specialist is. Um, so we're always happy to answer those questions. Uh, we also have it as a live stream on YouTube and you can go out to YouTube, type in M-U-I-P-M behind the dot com. Uh, you'll see all of our di different little snippets as we call them. And then you'll see the full video, which is gonna look like this. Always happy to have you join us either live on Zoom or live via YouTube. And they're recorded. So if you miss one, you can go to the YouTube channel and you can watch the recording. So we'll have for the next three weeks, of course, from noon to 1 p.m., we're going to have the garden hour. We do realize this is 4th of July week. A lot of people like to take off, but we are still planning to hold uh, the garden hour on July 5th. So make sure you join us if you're at home. 
And then a lot of great resources are always dropped into the chat box. So uh, if you go to the chat, if you look at where these three dots are down here, you can click on that and you can then save the chat to wherever it is you might like on your own computer. And then you can go ahead and look up all those great resources. And again, we just want to say thank you for joining us and we will see you all next week. Thank you.